Here's five-ish new things that are changing with Total War Warhammer 3 with the release of the Thrones of Decay DLC. Nemesis Crown. The Nemesis Crown is basically a new item that everyone can fight for in a similar vein to the Sword of Cain. You'll start getting notifications like this which tell you that the crown is somewhere about and it'll give you a rough general direction of where it is. If you should manage to get there in time, you might get a dig site which will allow you to make a play to get the crown, but if you're too slow, someone else might do it first, and then you'll have to go and kick their teeth off to get it for yourself, if you can beat them of course. Now in this case, Sexy Man Sigvold has claimed the crown and he happens to be coming my way, so naturally I'm going to make a play to get that crown. But what exactly does it do? Well, here you go. Plus 10 hit points, more money gained basically, a couple of strong damage spells, and buffs to your army's damage as well. With the downside though that you're getting minus 20 diplomatic relations with all factions. All freaking factions. But this is just level 1 of the crown. Now if I go ahead and bonk Sigvald on the head carefully, not to break the crown of course, I will then gain the crown for myself. But I have a choice. You see, I could take the Nemesis crown for myself and gain all that lovely power. Naturally, it's very tempting. It's only a small diplomatic penalty. We get an extra chance of plague spreading as well. There are some unique to different factions buffs too. Or I could seal the crown away, get some buffs to my replenishment, and then nobody has to worry about the crown at all in the world and everyone will be safe from it, at least for a while. Now, of course, I'm a power-hungry maniac, so I'm going to take the goddamn crown, and I'm going to keep running with it. But one does not simply pick up the Nemesis crown. You must serve the Nemesis crown. You can see here, number of battles to win the next Nemesis crown level, four. So once I've done four battles, I will level up the crown and make it stronger. But if I don't have any battles within the next seven turns, I will, in fact, lose the crown. Once I win those four battles, though, you can see what it'll upgrade to, which upgrades the buffs I already have and adds in some new ones, like an extra 10% movement range after after winning battles, that wasn't there before, but also negative ones. I now have plus 10 army upkeep, which I didn't have before, so it's making things worse and better for you at the same time. And here, as I fight that fourth battle and get that upgrade, I can now choose again whether I want to continue with that upgrade or if I want to seal the crown again. And if we move on to see what's different between level 2 and 3, you can see things are starting to get a little crazy. I'm getting plus 15% army upkeep. I'm getting minus 60 diplomatic penalties with all factions. That's pretty huge. But of course, I'm getting everything buffed up. All the abilities and buffs are getting stronger for me. But so are the debuffs. So it's a bit of a toss-up, a bit of a high-risk, high-reward situation. You can decide if it's worth the unlimited power. <clears throat> Next. Gotrek and Felix. So some changes to how Gotrek and Felix work in campaign and how they are recruited. Because no longer might they just appear if you build a tavern in a region. They'll now come via a quest which you get issued at level 15, the adventures of Gotrek and Felix, which will require you to fight a quest battle to unlock them. Now, in this case for Karl Franz, I'm fighting Slanesh. I don't know if it's different for other factions or lords, but you can discover that surprise for yourself. And I won't spoil the battle, but it was more than just a straight up battle, so that was cool. And you do have Gotrek and Felix in the battle who you do have to keep alive, which is actually pretty damn challenging because Gotrek's a nut job. But once you've won the battle, there it is. You now have Gotrek and Felix. And what's nice is that they are now both classed as legendary heroes, as they should be, which means you can now put them in your main army as heroes if you want to. No longer does Gotrek have to pretend to be a lord. He can now just be the hero he wants to be. So some nice changes to Gotrek and Felix, I think, should make accessing them a little bit more reliable. And you don't just have to wait for them to turn up. All right, on to... Cataclysm Spells. So the Cataclysm Law Spellbook has had an overhaul, all the spells have been revamped, which might not sound that exciting because all of these spells are pretty much locked to the Realms of Chaos campaign and those specific quest battles. So the six people that play Realms of Chaos campaigns will be very excited, but this is still exciting for the rest of us because you can now get these spells through Balthazar Gelt in his Empire campaign. His new Colleges of Magic mechanics open these up for him to use, so he gets access to these very powerful spells. And if you want to know more about the Colleges of Magic mechanic, I've got a video for that i'll link it at the end but some of these are pretty nutty like this one time amok this will freeze the enemy army in place literally the entire enemy army cannot move for a pretty whopping 45 seconds meaning you can absolutely blast them to bits with missiles you see here all these units now cannot move i mean some of them are falling into formation in the background there but they can't move from where they are and what's more, your units will gain plus 40% speed and 20% charge bonus. And look how fast these Empire Knights move. It looks like they're on fast forward, but they're not. This is normal game speed. 
and they are just absolutely going to devastate all these units that cannot move and do anything about the charges that I am laying all over their faces. So naturally, 133 speed Empire Knights get pretty nasty. So some nice changes to the Cataclysm spells. They are much more potent than they were before, many of them anyway. And it's nice to have them in Immortal Empires rather than just stuck behind the Realms of Chaos. Hopefully we'll see more factions get access to them over time as well. All right, on to the next one. It's one you might have been waiting for. It's... Stuff. So this one's actually going to be a random assortment of a few different smaller things. Number one, we're getting a whole bunch of new maps on the Chaos Coast. There's about maybe eight land battles, a couple of ambush battles, choke point battles. So always nice to have new maps in, even though they're kind of just there in the background and they appear as you come across them. I always like having new landscapes to fight on. Sadly, doesn't seem to be any new dwarf maps though, which I was kind of hoping for because there's not a ton of those kind of dwarfy themed. But still, like I say, maps are always nice. There's also a new option pre-campaign to enable Iron Man mode. This will stop you being able to manually save and will auto save just whenever something happens. Now this is of course something that's on legendary difficulty already and it's basically just bringing that but to all the other difficulties if you want it. So if you want a little more challenge and you want to get rid of the temptation of save scumming, well now you've got this to stop you. There also seems to be some new vehicle category abilities, such as the steam tank now being an armored vehicle, which makes it more like a real tank being heavily armored on the front, still armored on the sides and not so armored on the back. And as such, it comes with a gold shield on its armor, blocking 70% of all incoming missiles. So yeah, tanks are more tanky versus guns. There's also this new vehicle categorization on the new Thunder Barge for the Dwarves, listing it as a gunship, saying that you can't give it orders, it's just gonna blast whatever the hell it wants, whenever it wants. To me, it seems a little weird that we're getting these vehicle traits this late into Warhammer 3. I wonder if it means anything for future Total War. Hmm. And speaking of dwarfs, let's finish on... Dwarf Rework. So the dwarfs alongside the Empire in Nurgle got a bit of a rework. So what's changed? Well, first of all, the Oath Goal. That hasn't really changed. That still pretty much works the same as it did before. You acquire the currency through various means and then spend it on these things in the forge, which also require you to have some access to certain materials through trade. So that part, for the most part, is the same. What is new, though, is the new Age of Reckoning system, which gives you 10 turns to settle as many grudges as you possibly can. How well you do per age will place you somewhere on this five section bar, giving you various buffs or debuffs depending on how well or badly you do. So you're being encouraged to get stuck in and get after the dwarf enemies. But how do you actually settle those grudges? Well, armies and settlements will have this little number and symbol above their head showing the grudges they have incurred and the number that you can gain from taking them out. So 213 on them, 246 on this settlement, 190 on the army here and 246 on the settlement. So nearly a thousand settled grudges I can get from taking all of this out. And once I've done that and taken out another little army, you can see I've got 1,129 grudges done, which puts me just in the second segment, meaning I'm going to get some negatives, but I still have seven turns to get some more of the grudges up. If I can get to 50%, I'll move into some positives. And you may also notice that I get Grudge Settler units if I get to these certain points. These are units that basically act like regiments of renown. Once they're in the pool, I can recruit them whenever. And they do have slightly different variations on the actual normal unit, like the Slayers have Armor Sundering, for example. So those are a new thing to work towards trying to gain as well. As for the tech tree, this has had a little bit of an overhaul as well. It still works kind of similarly. You have the guild section and the clan section, but they now have their own tabs and everything's much more clearly laid out. You have certain sections for different kinds of units, infantry, missile units, war machines, etc. There are some cool new abilities and stuff for some units, but I'll let you discover those for yourself. As for the Great Book of Grudges itself, this has been changed as well. You now have legendary grudges, which are applying to all dwarf factions, not just yours. And these are things that are pretty hefty tasks, like taking all of the dwarf provinces in the mountains. This will unlock the underway network, which is another new feature as well, not to be confused with simply tunneling around and using that little stance. This is in fact a fast travel system for the dwarfs to move around the mountains, but only in areas that they've secured. Now, if you look around the map closely, you can see all these little tunnel icons showing you all the places where these underway network entrances are. So it's a really nice collective dwarf thing, but it also does depend if the dwarf factions do well, which is obviously out of your control. But I do enjoy these kind of mechanics that give a bit of freedom to factions to move around from where they might normally start or hang around. So it's a nice feature overall. But that's just one thing of your legendary grudges. There's all sorts for different factions. Some of them you have to take out elves and just make them extinct, which is obviously the best ones. Although this one allows you to summon units of miners, which is pretty cool. 
So over the course of campaigns, these things might get done and give you some big buffs from the collective effort of all dwarf factions. And then there's the Legendary Lords section to the Great Book, which allows you to confederate lords. This is just a great way to get some lords that may have died off, their factions killed off, but I think you can still get the Legendary Lord back, even if the faction is killed off. So a nice way to confederate some of the other dwarf Legendary Lords. And then there's just a bit telling you about all the different Grudge Settler units, which I mentioned earlier, you recruit those via the Age of Reckoning, yada yada yada. There we go, five-ish things that have changed in Total War Warhammer 3 coming alongside the Thrones of K DLC. I hope you've enjoyed this. Thanks for watching. I will see you in the future.